Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds, and welcome to Ape's Video Notes for Topic 7.2, which is Photochemical Smog. Our objective for the day is to be able to explain the causes and effects of photochemical smog, as well as methods to reduce it. And the skill that we'll practice at the end of today's video will be describing relationships between different variables in a set of data. Before we look at the actual formation of photochemical smog, we need to understand some of the precursors or the compounds that contribute to it, and then the environmental conditions that are required for smog to form. And so first we'll take a look at what we call the precursors. You can think of this as kind of the ingredients of smog. The first thing we need is nitrogen dioxide. And so this is going to be broken down by the sunlight down into nitric oxide. And that free oxygen that comes off of the NO2 will combine with O2 that's in the atmosphere and that will form ozone. So ozone is also a precursor here, but remember it's a secondary pollutant. So it's actually gonna come from the reaction of nitrogen dioxide and the sunlight. Then we have VOX or volatile organic compounds. This is kind of a catch all phrase that includes a bunch of different hydrocarbon compounds. And we need to know some of their characteristics. Some of their characteristics are that they're very easily vaporized or volatilized. And so they evaporate really easily at room temperature. Acetone, which is an ingredient in nail polish remover is a common example. So think about if you've ever used nail polish remover or seen it, you know, you can spill a little bit on a desk and it will really quickly vaporize or evaporate. And so that is, you know, of course, where the V in volatile organic compounds comes from. We should also know that they're carbon based. That's what an organic compound is. And so again, these are gonna be things like hydrocarbons and other things would include uh, gasoline in terms of sources, formaldehyde, and basically anything that is involving uh, petrochemicals or plastic production often will emit vox as well. There are some natural sources of vox, which would include coniferous trees or pine trees, as you like to think of them maybe. Uh, and so think of that pine smell that you might smell when you're out in the forest. That's an example of a volatile organic compound being given off by the tree. And I have to say, uh, if you're an AP Chem teacher or a Chem student, or if my Orgo professor from Hope College, Dr. Sanford somehow happens to see this, I'm so sorry for the stereo chem of this volatile organic compound that has been completely butchered. Uh, it's supposed to be ethanol, um, but yeah, forgive me for this stereo chem sin that I've committed. All right. The last ingredient we need to form smog is going to be ozone. And so this is a secondary air pollutant. It's formed when nitrogen dioxide is broken down by the sunlight and that free oxygen that's removed binds with O2. And so we should know that in the troposphere down near earth, it's a respiratory irritant to humans and it can also damage plant stomata. So it can damage their pores that they use to take in carbon dioxide and so it can limit plant growth. Now we'll take a look at the environmental conditions that are required for smog formation. As you know, uh, you know, sunlight is needed to break down that nitrogen dioxide. So that's a huge component of smog formation. It's going to drive ozone production by breaking down nitrogen dioxide and producing ozone. And then we have warmth. So the warmer it is, the faster these reactions that create photochemical smog are going to occur. Also, the warmer it is, the faster volatile organic compounds are going to evaporate. So that's also going to speed up the production of photochemical smog. Now we'll take a look at normal ozone formation, which we have to understand before we can take a look at how photochemical smog forms. So normally what we have is early morning traffic. And so the morning commute, commute is going to produce a bunch of nitrogen oxides in the atmosphere. And so we have NO2 concentrations building up. So here's our NO2 molecule. Then when the sun comes out, the energy from the sun is going to break nitrogen dioxide down into nitric oxide, NO, and a free oxygen atom. Now this free oxygen atom is very reactive and so it wants to bind with something. And so it's gonna bind with oxygen, O2, which is readily available in the atmosphere. So we have this little red line representing the bond and we have oxygen binding with O2 and we can add those up to know that O plus O2 becomes O3 and so that's ozone. So now we have ozone formation. What happens normally though, uh, in non you know ideal smog forming conditions is that uh, ozone is going to kind of peak in the afternoon. So, you know, we're, we're producing nitrogen dioxide early in the morning, and then the sun's coming out and it's breaking down nitrogen dioxide into nitric oxide and the free oxygen, and then we're forming ozone. But what normally happens is that at night, you know, the sun goes down. And so we stop driving this production of nitric oxide and therefore of ozone. 
And so then at night, the ozone just naturally recombines with nitric oxide, and we basically reverse the reaction and produce nitrogen dioxide and O2 again. And so under these conditions, smog is not going to be, you know, prevalent because we're not building up huge concentrations of ozone in the atmosphere. It's building up during the day, but then it's breaking down at night when the sun is no longer driving that production of ozone. I will take a look at how different conditions can lead to photochemical smog production. And so the first steps here are going to be the same as our normal ozone production. So I'm going to go through them fairly quickly, but just a reminder that that morning commute, you know, traffic ramping up from the kind of 7.30 to 9.30 time period, that's going to produce all of this nitrogen dioxide. And it's really key to when ozone formation occurs and when smog formation occurs. You know, so we have our sun coming up, we have our nitrogen dioxide is broken down to nitric oxide and oxygen. Our oxygen combines with O2, so then we're forming ozone. Uh, so there we have our ozone. And this should hopefully look familiar from normal ozone production. The next step would be that the sun would go down and at night the ozone and the nitric oxide would just combine and reform nitrogen dioxide and oxygen. But when we form photochemical smog, we have the introduction of another ingredient or precursor here that's going to alter this reaction. It's going to prevent it from reversing. And those would be volatile organic compounds. And so remember that volatile organic compounds come from things like gasoline or, you know, detergents or cleaning solutions used in laundromats. They come from pretty much any petrochemical process, so plastic production. And so when they evaporate, you know, from the ground, when oil drips on the ground or from these factories, they enter the atmosphere and they alter the dynamic of this reaction they're going to bind with nitric oxide and form something called photochemical oxidants. Again, this is a big catch-all phrase for a bunch of different compounds. You don't need to know their specific formulas or names, but you should be familiar with this idea that Vox and nitric oxide together form photochemical oxidants. And so the problem now is that the nitric oxide is not free to recombine with ozone and reverse this process. And so ozone is going to build up. So instead of recombining with nitric oxide, you know, breaking back down into oxygen and nitrogen dioxide, we now have a buildup of ozone. So we have this represented here with a bunch of ozone molecules in the atmosphere. And when ozone and photochemical oxidants combine, the result is photochemical smog. And so that's what photochemical smog is. It's the combination of ozone and these photochemical oxidants. And remember that the ozone is not breaking down naturally as it would normally because the nitric oxide that it would recombine with is bound to the Vox and that's forming the photochemical oxidants. Now we'll take a look at factors that increase uh, the formation of photochemical smog. And we also have a static diagram here. So one that's not going to move around with animations. So if you want a diagram to draw in terms of how smog forms, this would be a great opportunity here on this slide. And so the first factor that's going to in, uh, increase photochemical smog production is increased traffic. So vehicles, of course, emit nitrogen dioxide. They're one of the main sources of nitrogen dioxide. So when we increase the number of vehicles on the road, we increase smog formation. Another factor is going to be higher volatile organic compound emissions. And so urban areas that have a lot of gas stations, that have a lot of you know, industry practices that are involving petrochemicals or other volatile organic compounds, they're going to contribute to smog formation as well. Warmer temperatures and more sunlight. So we're going to see higher smog levels in the summer and also in the late afternoon when sunlight you know, has been peaking. We're also going to see higher temperatures contributing to more smog formation. It speeds up the evaporation of volatile organic compounds. It speeds up the production of ozone. And so the warmer it gets, the more smog we develop. And so the big takeaway here that we need to be aware of is because of all of these factors, urban areas are going to be far more likely to experience smog than suburban or rural areas. So let's review these really quickly here. You know, we're going to have more traffic, higher density of cars in urban areas, so we're going to have higher levels of nitrogen dioxide. We're also going to have uh, hotter temperatures. We have something called the urban heat island effect. So all the black top has a low albedo, it absorbs more sunlight, and it leads to warmer temperatures. Warmer temperatures, remember, drive these reactions, but they also lead to increased evaporation of volatile organic compounds. And when it's warmer, citizens demand more electricity. They use more electricity for air conditioning and refrigeration. And so what that's going to do is actually produce more nitrogen oxides in nearby areas due to the power plants that are likely burning coal or natural gas, uh, both of which release nitrogen dioxides. And finally, we'll wrap up today looking at some of the impacts of smog and reviewing some of the ways to reduce smog. 
So environmentally, smog is going to limit photosynthesis as it blocks out sunlight, so reduces plants' ability to photosynthesize. It's also going to damage their stomata, and so smog can really inhibit plant growth. Uh, just as it does with humans, though, smog can irritate the respiratory tracts of animals. And so if we're talking about human health effects, though, we want to be a little bit more specific. So we should mention that smog makes asthma worse. It can make uh, COPD can make bronchitis and emphysema worse. It can also be an eye irritant. And so ozone is a really, you know, damaging pollutant when it comes to human health. Then if we look at economic costs, we have lost economic productivity due to the time that workers miss from being sick. Um, we even have studies that are linking ground level ozone to premature death. And so economies suffer when citizens are dying earlier than they should. They're not working. You know, we have costs associated with that from a healthcare standpoint. So it's really costly from an economic standpoint as well. Uh, agricultural yields can even be decreased when we have smog that's impacting nearby areas. You know, the wind can disperse smog. And so smog can affect areas outside of the urban areas, uh, even if we don't have the right conditions in these suburban or these rural areas. And so all of these factors are causes for concern when it comes to smog. So let's talk about how to reduce it. Well, the first way to reduce smog is to reduce the total number of vehicles on the road and the distance they're traveling. And that's because vehicle emissions are one of the biggest sources of NOx in the atmosphere. And so, you know, if we lower the number of vehicles on the road and lower the amount of gasoline consumed, then we decrease the amount of nitrogen dioxide able to form ozone and able to form smog. Using less gasoline also results in fewer volatile organic compounds because every time you go to the gas station, you know, a little of that gasoline drips out of the nozzle, it lands on the ground, and then it evaporates into the atmosphere. So we reduce that contribution to smog formation as well. If we want to talk about electricity production, that's another way that we can limit the production of photochemical smog using renewable energy sources that don't produce nitrogen dioxide would be a great alternative. So solar, wind, and hydroelectricity are all, you know, no NO2 emission sources of electricity. Uh, if we are still going to use fossil fuels, though, switching from coal to natural gas will drastically reduce the amount of nitrogen oxides produced. And so that's another way that we could reduce uh, photochemical smog formation. So for practice FRQ 7.2 today, I want you to take a look at this graph, which has the concentration of a number of different compounds at various times of day. The first thing I want you to do is try to explain the relationship between nitrogen dioxide concentration and ozone concentration that's represented in this graph. I also want you to take a look at the time of day and describe the relationship between time of day and ozone formation or how the time of day impacts ozone formation. 